Uh, welcome to the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, we're giving a talk this evening about failures in Selenium tests. We've uh, been a little cheeky and called it epic fail um, because it is epic. Um, when you uh, do a unit test, it's a very encapsulated, it's a very small thing. When something breaks, you know just why it broke. Um, when you're doing browser testing, it, you can have things fail for any number of reasons. Um, we're going to explain our system that we use here at the foundation to do browser testing with uh, a number of tools, um, number of hosts, a number of uh, interrelated systems. Um, we're also going to discuss, we're going to, the core of our system is a continuous integration tool called Jenkins. And we're going to, using only the evidence that is presented to us in Jenkins, we're going to reason through some of the reasons for some very common browser test failures that I know you in, here in the room have encountered and uh, you've seen these sorts of things. And we're going to look at what Jenkins presents us and take it from there. Uh, we should also mention that um, it's possible to assert uh, things about software tests in a number of different ways, um, from the very simple to the very complex. In this particular case, we are using the assertion library in RSpec. Uh, it's a very commonly used Ruby assertion library. We're using the very bare bones aspects of RSpec, but um, if you're interested in the particular syntax of anything we see this evening, um, that's where it comes from. But our main concern is the system itself and how things fail. And I'd like to explain a little bit before we jump into the actual demonstrations of actual failures. I want to talk about the systems in which these tests are running. I've made a little diagram here, and I know it's difficult to see online. I'm hoping I can explain it well enough to get my point across. At the core here, we have Jenkins. Jenkins is a continuous integration server. It uh, used to be called Hudson. It's been around a long time. Jenkins does anything. You give it a set of commands, and it issues a, those commands, and it tells you what happens. In our particular system, when we start a build of Selenium tests in Jenkins, the first thing that the Jenkins server does is it reaches out to another server where we have our source code repository. This is in Git. It's managed by a code review system called Garrett. Um, could be anything. It could be CVS. It could be SVN. It could be Perforce. It could be whatever you want. But you want to keep your tests in a source code control system of some sort. We happen to use Git, and the interface to Git is Garrett. When our tests kick off, on the Jenkins host, we have particular versions of Ruby, particular version of Selenium, particular version of a wrapper of Selenium that we call Water Web Driver, uh, a number of other tools. This is all completely open, by the way. You can find all of our configuration live, open, online. It is open to your perusal in the source code system on both Garrett and also on GitHub. When the test kicks off, we pull over our tests. Our tests run according to both browser and target test environment. We'll see more of this in detail later on. Um, we send that information off to uh, our friends at Sauce Labs, and we tell it to use a particular browser and a particular um, test target. Sauce Lab spins up a virtual machine on command that is running Firefox, Chrome, or some version of Internet Explorer. And we will point our tests to one of several test environments. We have a test environment that we call the Beta Labs cluster. This is our completely fresh Beta Labs. Every few minutes is updated to the latest version of the master of head. Um, we also target the test2 wiki, which is what we call it. It is a peer to the English Wikipedia, the German Wikipedia. It is another node on the production Wikipedia cluster, and we treat this as our staging area. We have a number of tests that run against production, just sanity checks, but uh, these are our main test environments right here. Are there any questions so far about what we're doing here? Anything unfamiliar? Anyone want to clarify anything? Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, quick question. So when you 
call Sauce Labs, you're using that essentially as a, the Jenkins slave at that point, correct? No, sir. Um, the Jenkins slave is actually a technical term. If you, you can have multiple instances of the Jenkins servers, and one Jenkins will report back to the other Jenkins. We have only one instance of the Jenkins uh, tool running right now. What this means is that Sauce Labs provides an API. And you, you call that API with a number of different parameters. Your, your user, your password, your, um, uh, uh, Shelka would know more details than I would. Um, you can follow up with him at the time. But there's a number of parameters that uh, Sauce Labs API accepts. And when you send it a well-formed request, it just operates on that request. So it is not, in that sense, a slave to Jenkins. It is a two-way communication over the Sauce Labs provided API. Virtual environment. Explain why it's a virtual environment. A virtual environment, yes. Uh, upon issuing this command over the Sauce Labs API, Sauce Labs creates on the spot from scratch an entire virtual machine with an operating system, uh, uh, I don't even know what else is on there. So let me turn it over to my colleague. Oh. <clears throat> I'll just try to be quick. So the light is going to my eyes. Um, yeah, as, as Chris said, uh, Jenkins slave is a is a is a Jenkins Jenkins term, and the way we run tests. So Selenium provides a way to run the test on your machine or on a remote machine. And we just use this option to run on a remote, remote machine. You in that case, you need to provide credentials to running on this remote machine, and that's it. So it's not technically a Jenkins slave, but yes, it behaves like that. So the tests are not running on the Jenkins machine, but somewhere else. So the format for this evening's thing, in a moment, I'll switch the, the screen share from, uh, from me to, uh, to Jenkins itself. But we're going to talk about the problem with analyzing browser test failures is that you see a common set of problems, and it's often very difficult to tell the root cause, the underlying cause for this common set of problems. So what we're going to do is use these tools available to us to look at some really common sorts of issues. Um, we're going to look at system problems, that is, issues somewhere within this entire system where something breaks down. Um, after that, we're going to look at um, timeouts, when your application simply freezes or doesn't do the right thing. Then we're going to take a break. Breaks are good. Um, after that, we're going to talk about some real, actual, down-in-the-dirt problems that the tests turn up. And I'm going to point out that there a number of people have acted or tried to, over the years, to rename automated tests to call them change detectors. We're going to look at a couple of examples where the application being tested changed, but it wasn't a bug. And then we're going to look at a couple of examples where we found some bugs. And um, we found, have found some really important bugs in recent times. Um, I will make a note that. Um, one thing that I would have really liked to have shown you tonight is a browser-specific bug. In the past, we've had, we have one application that fights with Internet Explorer version 9, i.e. 9, and this thing just don't get along. Unfortunately, all of my uh, examples age off after 60 days, so all of the examples that you're going to see tonight have, we have incurred within the last 60 days. Um, so without further ado, if there's any more questions, I'm going to switch over to Jenkins. And um, I will also uh, reiterate that um, we have a mailing list with about oh, something close to 100 people on it now. It's really high signal. It's really low noise. If you're interested in these sorts of issues, um, there's some really, really smart people. On the, if you look at lists.wikimedia.org and just go down the list and find QA, uh, it might be worth your time. So let me switch over to the Jenkins view, and we'll start talking about system failures. So 
So I'm going to start you off with all-out thermonuclear heck, as they said in Dr. Strangelove. All of our red builds that you saw there earlier, I also, if you have your laptop, I encourage you to follow along. Um, wmf.ci.cloudbees.com. This is maybe the worst we've ever seen. These red builds, they should have one, maybe five failing tests, right? I've got 30 failures in a single build, 30 failures in a single build. And you can see from the name of our, uh, our thing, this is, um, this is our Firefox build. Our Firefox build is almost always our most reliable build. It's running against our beta labs test environment, which is our less reliable test environment, but 30 failures, that's just terrible, terrible. Let's see what's happening. Jenkins gives us all the clues. It, it is all the links to all the things that we need to see. What Sauce Labs tells us, Sauce Labs, you were asking about Cucumber earlier. Cucumber tells us exactly what's going on in the test. We can actually see that I'm at a new page's feed, and I should see this link, and I should see this link, and I should see an icon, and I should see a button, and we can see that it timed out looking for a really simple link. So of course this is, I was a little worried when I saw this right offhand. So we follow a link and that takes us to Sauce Labs. Sauce actually has a really sweet new user interface and you can see, anybody knows what it means when you see the blue page? It says Wikimedia Foundation error. <laughs> the host was down. Beta Labs was completely down. This was, and again, without this visual reinforcement, it's really easy to say, you know, this is terrible, this is terrible, what do we do? 30 test failures in a single build. But it was simply that Beta Labs was down. So we actually went through this entire rigmarole all the way out to here. This entire system functioned flawlessly until we got to the test environment but the test environment was hosed. So as a result of this and certain other issues, we are actually have begun a project to do far better monitoring of our test environments. We should really find out that our test environment is down before our browser tests run. Make sense? So this is, this is coming, it's not here today, but it's coming, and this is exactly the reason, because we can't afford to fail 30 tests in a row. Question. Yes, sir. From, comes online. Uh, question is, how often do you run sam Okay, question. How often do you run sanity tests run against production? And how do you configure tests to be run at different levels? Test versus production. Doesn't have to be asked right at this moment, he says so. That's actually fine. Um, I plan to move very slowly tonight. I welcome questions. I welcome interruptions. Feel free. Um, this is the, the times at which tests are run is highly configurable in Jenkins and just in general. As of right now today, we run, with, with a few exceptions, we run our tests twice a day. And, one, and we run all of them at essentially the same time. At the, uh, one run goes overnight, and then we look at them the first thing in the morning. And another run happens at around lunchtime, Pacific time, so that we can look at them before we leave for the day. And I have an ulterior motive in giving this talk, actually. I am very much hoping that some of you will actually look at our failed builds. And I hope that some of you will join the mail list. And I hope that some of you will say, why was this build failing? I want, would really like people to ask me these questions. I would really like people to look at our failed builds from the community and see and, and think very carefully and ask good questions for me and for Joko and for the rest of the foundation. Why are these builds failing? failing? And what can we do about it? And what can we learn from it? In the very near future, without going into too much detail, what we'd like to do very soon is we have begun moving these browser tests into the Git repos of the features that they are 
that are being tested. So we are actually right now analyzing the possibility of running a browser test suite after each commit to that particular Git repo. Um, we have a few technical issues to solve. Um, one of the things that we have done here at this all hands meeting with Joko and myself and some other people from France and from the UK and from other places is talk about how to do this and do this well. But as of right now, uh, they run, as I said, twice a day. Whether it's taste environments production, they all run twice a day. And they're all analyzed twice a day. And um, when we're really lucky, we report a bug. Any other questions? Let me take another example here. Mark Holmquist is going to like this one. Oh, I will also point out that the, the root cause of this failure of the entire uh, test environment being down was it was on a file system that was the file system itself was NFS. And we did a really poor job of managing NFS. So, um, oh, I take it back. I'm going to take a, before I get to uh, some of these, I'm going to look at, so there's some other really intriguing system errors. And we're going to examine some of the things that you might see out of a Jenkins job. Some of these are mysterious, but uh, we have explanations. Here we have our, we have run tests for mobile applications. Um, there's a gentleman talking about mobile, testing mobile applications. Um, these are some of our mobile mobile tests, and again we have our uh, we have our link to Sauce Labs, and we have our um, cucumber to page steps. This is a very mysterious error, unable to pick a platform. To the best of our knowledge, this is actually a glitch in Sauce Labs. If Sauce Labs is overloaded, it may actually tell you that it can't find a VM or it can't launch one. Strangely enough, it seems to have actually done this according to what we have, but it's reporting that it did not. This is terribly frustrating. This comes in waves. We'll get we'll get this for an hour on, you know, like a Friday afternoon or something. I'll show you one more mysterious one, also frustrating. See, we let it all hang out here at the foundation. we got no secrets. Um, we'll show you our mysteries because we like to help, like all the help we can get. This one is perplexing. The build is red. The test result has no failures. So what do you do here, right? You've got You've got no cucumber steps. Okay, what have you done? You've got no cucumber steps. You've got no error message. Jenkins gives you a thing. Jenkins actually is pretty smart. Um, as I noted here, Jenkins runs on its own host, and it runs Ruby and Selenium on this host. And Jenkins, conveniently enough, logs the console output for every run of every build and you can see we correctly actually find all of the tests to be run. We load them up. We attempt to run them. And then Jenkins is telling me that the host that it runs on, it, it's going to shell out to execute these tests. And whatever happened on that host returned a non-zero result. This is, again, one of the pitfalls of working with uh, hosted services. Our Jenkins host runs on a service called CloudBees. And um, from time to time, the CloudBees host will, in fact, give us a non-zero result for a, a shell command. Again, it's terribly frustrating. But also, again, with a system this complex, it's something you have to expect from time to time. This is my favorite. Chad's not around, is he? OK. Probably good. Probably wise. Isn't this nice? 
It's red, no cucumber, no status, no nothing. All it says, failed to determine. Failed to determine. Okay, anybody want to guess where in the system? Jelko doesn't count. Anybody want to guess where this went down? Uh, hang on a second. Come back. Console output. Console output is your friend. The requested URL returned error 503. Service temporary unavailable from Garrett. Garrett was down for a while. and So if you can't pull your tests, you can't run your tests, can't crank up a VM because you've got nothing to feed your API. So yeah, Garrett was down at a, at a really inconvenient time. But as you can see, you know, the, uh, a cursory look at the test results doesn't tell you that much, right? Okay, so these are my grand examples from the last 60 days of system problems. These are, we've had a problem here, we've had problems here, we've had problems here. They're all different problems. They all manifest themselves in different ways. And what I wanted to demonstrate, what I really want to get across is that they can all be analyzed. All of the information you need to understand what's going on in these systems is available in Jenkins, in your continuous integration uh, server. Whether it's Jenkins, could be Travis, could be you know whatever you use. All of that information to analyze what's happening should be available to you. And if it's not, you're probably using the wrong CI server. And if you've rolled your own, you probably should be using a CI server. Michael might be living with some of my legacy test runners. I don't even know if you guys are still running that thing, but Oh, I'm so glad. OK, any questions so far? I'm about to switch to a different subject. But uh, um, I wanted to make sure that you understood that this, when we run these tests, it is an entire system that we're exercising. Are there any questions about what we've seen so far? Awesome, I'll move on to the next. Excuse me one moment. Here we go. Oh, it's dropped. Okay. Here we go. We have an application called Upload Wizard. <laughs> Mark Holmquist has worked on Upload Wizard. He says funny things about it. And we have the develop in the room. We have two of the Upload Wizard developers. You can see we have a typical thing. It timed out, right? And we know from experience at this point that timeouts, who knows what a timeout means, right? Anything could happen. Anything could be broken. This is where Sauce comes in enormously handy. The first thing you see when you click on the link to Sauce Labs is the last page that the test saw. So here, what you can see, the very last page, it's kind of hard to see here, but the very last page that the test saw is a spinner. Here's Upload Winners Wizard just spinning, spinning away, spinning away. This is a real failure, um, but it's not a real bug. Uh, this application uploads files to our commons uh, thing. If it's a large file, it'll take a while. If it's a slow network, it'll take a while. And again, the internet itself plays a factor here because you're doing all these hops among all these hosts on the internet. And um, timeouts are a fact of life. But timeouts in Upload Wizard are a big fact of life. 
So um, I do have a test for Upload Wizard. I'm not that fond of them because they fail a lot. Um, this is something that Jocko and I talk about, but we haven't actually done anything about yet. It's on our list. And I have a similar example of another. Also, I should also mention that if you're, if you're interested in the source code for these tests, the Upload Wizard test is rather a masterpiece, if I say so myself. It does some really remarkable things. It was one of the first tests that Jocko works on worked on. It logs in with a secret password. It generates a uh, image file on the fly of a random nature. It uploads this file. It checks that the upload worked. It's really a rather remarkable browser test because it involves a file system and it runs consistently on Linux, Mac, and Windows. So um, it's pretty slick if you're interested in these sorts of things. The source code for, for the upload wizard test is, is really remarkable and Jelko is the the architect of that. Um, does some fancy DOM manipulation, as I recall. It's a, yes, it does. Um, we have another another test because this is a, another feature that breaks from time to time. We have the ability, if you bring up a, a page in Wikipedia, you can download that page as a PDF. And we have, in the past, broken this feature pretty often. So we have an automated test for it. And it's, it runs most of the time pretty well. But we go to the Sauce Labs. And again, we find the very last page that we see says rendering. As I recall, this test goes to a random page. If we uh, pick a page that's particularly large, the test will time out. We probably should not send it to a random page. There's so much refactoring. As you've seen in, uh, in our builds, um, a lot of our builds are green. I mean, a lot of our builds are, are red today. And again, if you, uh, if you have your laptops with you, um, I was uh, hoping at the end of this session that perhaps people who have particular interests, you are welcome to surf around, find red builds, look at the problems, look at the histories. Uh, we have the architects of those tests here in the room and the many of the developers on these applications here in the room as well. So with that, I'm going to take a short break, let people get up, get a beer, move around, ask any questions off the side if you want, um, surf the CloudBees side if you want, um, and when we come back in, say, 10 minutes, People online? Okay. We'll take a very short break, five minutes, and um, we'll come back and we'll talk about detecting actual change in the application, and we'll talk about detecting actual bugs in real applications over the last 60 days, so in just a few minutes. So for those uh, following online, we'll now, there's no way to pause the video, as far as I know, so we'll turn down the volume and in five minutes sharp, we will uh, start again. Thank you. <laughs> 